Peace and love, everyone. Welcome to the Houston and Roe podcast. I'm Andrew Houston. I'm a spiritual teacher, and I'm here with my good friend, uh, Dorothy Rowe, who is a wonderful energy healer. And we have a very, very special uh, guest tonight who Dorothy is going to introduce, Harry Alto. So I'll let you go ahead and uh, take it away, Dorothy. Thanks, Andrew. And thanks, Harry, for being with us. Uh, it always makes the podcast really special when we have a guest on. Um, all right, so Harry has been on the evolutionary journey for this entire lifetime and probably several others. And has written a beautiful book called The Landscape of Enlightenment. He's an artist. Uh, he does like, uh, what do we call those? Marble floors. He designs marble floors for like castles and palaces around the world and big fancy um, uh, like hotels and places like that. So you may have, if you've been to any kind of very fancy places, you might've seen some of his work. Uh, Harry uses his inner vision, which he's had ever since he was a young child. And uh, the book actually outlines from very earliest memories, from very early childhood, all the way through to the dignified age that he is now. Um, the refinement of perception and expansion of consciousness and the stabilization of higher states of consciousness. Harry helps others. He's a speaker and a teacher and he supports people in their evolutionary journeys. Uh, we're just so happy to all be together, the three of us tonight, and to be sharing the tonight's topic, which is the unfoldment of consciousness with all of you. And uh, really happy to have you joining us and uh, hope that you really enjoy tonight's presentation. So thanks everyone for being here. And I think we're just going to start right away by sort of diving in. Um, uh, Andrew and Harry are both, I'm the energy healer. So I'm kind of more like mm, the applied relative side of this story. But Andrew and Harry are more the deep understanding of the abstract nature of consciousness. Oh, so, and you get it too. No problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. So That's I think, story. let's go ahead and start with you guys. Uh, Harry, do you want to say a few words uh, on your own behalf about sure, well, how you. you got going on this or what your current yeah. work is or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before I start, it's kind of like, you know, Dorothy's a great healer and he, she takes, you know, she takes specific things in people, right? And she heals them so that they can become whole people so they can have uh, enlightenment and so forth. And I do exactly the same thing from the other direction. There's no difference whatsoever. I start with the big picture and work towards the small. She starts with something that really helps people, but what helps people is consciousness that grows, expands, becomes whole. So we're, we're doing this. Okay, you call me a healer. Then. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I start with the symptoms. People come to me with symptoms and they're yeah, like, mm -hmm. my back hurts or I'm having eye problems or whatever. And we start with a symptom and then we find out what the, the deep story is, the seed or the core of that imbalance. And always the answer is to bring totality to bear upon that particular seed issue, whatever it is. And sometimes it's not what it appears. I mean, if if a seed of a problem were obvious, then a person would have already healed themselves. It's oh, because, absolutely. right? So the, the job is to add one's own vision to that challenge. And then that helps to provide the perspective that allows the depth, the sort of deepening of consciousness to get into the seed area. So, <laughs> but this isn't, I mean, this is about you. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I'm the little slow to start, but I get going after a while. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing, the thing about this journey that we're on, that's why we're born. That's why we come here. You know, we're born. That's the first step, the essential step to waking up, getting born. And, nice. and if you remember that moment, and, and most people that, forget it, but some people don't. I, I can remember being born, you know, and I came, it felt like coming to heaven. It didn't feel the other way. Heaven's supposed to be on the other side somewhere. That's not how I view it, you know. It's not been my life, you know, when I was a kid. Now, give a little bit of background on, on my story, right? And uh, I started experiencing inner awareness or light or whatever you want to call it. I had no idea what it was. And 
I've had it since I was a kid and I didn't understand it. I certainly assumed, come on, everybody has to have that. Right. And there's no doubt about it. It's so natural there. Everybody has self-awareness. And it comes to light over the years that everybody does have self-awareness. It's just that they don't get it. Neither did I. I didn't understand that I had self -awareness. I didn't understand what it was. And as I grew older, you know, it got brighter and I, I wanted to understand it a little bit, understand this inner light that I had, it's shining at night during the day, this that and the other thing. And, and it was the only thing in my life that was stable. Mm. Everything else was changing all the time, up and down. I was a wild kid. I was a wild teenager, up and down. But this simplicity of consciousness, of self-awareness, was always there. It was so, I started reading books, you know, what gurus or teachers or mentors or, wrote about this state. And they, they called it all kinds of things. And I say, what the heck, you know, come on. This is not, this is not what they're saying. They're saying realization. They're saying enlightenment. That this is just inner awareness. What are you talking about? This is so simple. Everybody has it already. So, so, of course, that made me start looking at it deeper. And when I was a young man, I started meditating and going quite seriously into it, searching for what I was experiencing. And as I began to understand what that self-awareness state was and is, I didn't think I was getting anything from it because it was just there. It was always there. What the heck? Where's the benefits? You know, it's always a happy kid, but I didn't associate happiness or, or God or anything with self. I said, oh, no, I'm just sitting there. My little self took all the credit for everything else that it did. And um, as I started understanding what I was experiencing, that understanding alone sort of tripled the light, tripled the, tripled the influence, tripled the benefits. I started getting it. And I said, what? What's this? Just because just I understand it, suddenly it's stronger, bigger, fuller, richer. That doesn't make sense to me in the early days. And, but that's what happened. When I started understanding what self-awareness is, what conscious self is not just self-awareness because everybody's aware that they're alive, right? Right. And it didn't change, this understanding didn't change the self-awareness anyway. Self-awareness was still quiet, unbounded, full, always there, but it it felt like, and you know, these are just words, but it felt like everything started moving into it, kind of getting sucked into this massive field of unboundedness, but it wasn't disappearing in the process. It was like an empty truck. You were loading it up with stuff to deliver. <laughs> and, you know, I, I love this analogy of a room here. I'm sitting in a room. Right? And I look around, there's a roof, ceiling, walls, floor. And all that stuff defines this empty space. But, it, but it's not empty because it's a room. I'm living in it. The outside is cold, there's wind, there's this, there's that. It's protecting me from all that. So these beautiful pictures on the wall, this, that, the other thing, it defines a beautiful space. It's kind of like consciousness. It's defined by the body the environment, the immediate environment, the distant environment, the stars, the universe, God, all of those are sheets or layers of, of definition of my own consciousness, everybody's consciousness. And I began to understand that a little bit when I was a young dude, as much as a young person can understand. And, and that feeling that Consciousness, pure consciousness, unboundedness, this inner stillness that I had, it woke up. 
it became something. It became, it, it, how could I say it? It acquired a physiology, it acquired eyeballs, it acquired ears, it, it acquired the small cell. It got it. And not only, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a huge movement, you know, um, the no self experience and Advaiti movement. And I have no problem with that. Okay, just get, don't get me wrong. Um, my experience was that that state was there and is always there. And it is the first stage of enlightenment, of self-realization. I hate those words, but we don't have other words. You know, we don't have any other words. So I use those words too. And this stillness or silence in me, as soon as I put my attention on it, in the early days now, my attention is always there, but when I put my attention in the early days on this, uh, on this uh, stillness, this unboundedness, it stirred like an ocean, putting a finger in a calm, silent ocean, putting a finger in, stirring them, waves start going up, ripples start going up. And over time, I realized that this consciousness was related to me. It wasn't different. Oh, oh, is it kind of like babies when you watch babies in the crib and they're they're sitting there and they see these things kind of floating in front of them. They think, what are you see them looking at these things? You, what are these things? And then one day, slowly, the hand comes and it comes and it goes like that. And they're looking okay. at it. <laughs> and they realize that's mine. That's my thing. And after that. They never look the same. It's never like, what are those things? It's like, can I move it this way? Oh, I'm moving it that way. Oh, I got it back. Up. It's like, it just changed. Like there's a shift right there. It's like a, a cognitive shift or something when the baby's like, oh, that's my thing that I've been waving around in front of myself. <laughs> well, it's, that's not just the baby does that. Right. Like, you've described the uh, process of waking up on these various levels. It's always if something else comes in it's not something else goes out. It comes into you. You become it. Oh, that's so interesting. In, in not going out. And oh. the process of waking up for me, and I assume for everybody, will ultimately be uh, the assimilation, the integration, the accepting of, the coming in of your environment, your friends, your relatives, the society, the world, the stars, the universe, and ultimately God all come in. You're the home of it all. And the home of it all is you, both directions. Ooh, that's both direction. Now, Harry, I've got a question. Why do you say that it comes into you when could it be that it kind of like it integrates from both directions. Like I've had sometimes the experience that as I'm seeking the divine, the divine's also seeking me, something like that, that we're sort of coming towards that the, the larger level of expression of self is seeking the, to be unified with the individuality at the same time that the individuality is seeking to be unified with a larger expanded, you know, infinite level of self. Of course, it's always a two way street except at the beginning, it always feels as if uh, there's a sequence to it. It hasn't arrived yet. Right, so- and Part the, of it is coming. So I see what you're saying is that in the beginning, the individual feels that they are seeking because it hasn't integrated yet. So they're not really, they haven't fully embraced or integrated their larger self. So the, their experience is that they're seeking it. Is it that right? All, it hasn't all arrived yet. Right. It's on its way. Let's call the first stage kind of, you know, um, what? I hate the word empty, but still quiet. It's ready for something. And what's it ready for? Whatever can fit in. <laughs> first thoughts, feelings, um, understanding, um, and eventually, you know, you know, I went through these stages of um, awakening and 
they, they, prior to those stages, it seemed like awakening was taking place. As soon as I got to that stage, it wasn't awakening at all. It was just kind of a, a river that's moving forward. You know, this word enlightenment, um, I've never... I've never related to it because every time I got somewhere that was described by others as enlightenment, the enlightenment went away. Hmm. You got it now. Right, you yeah, that's that's also been a topic of discussion at our house, Andrew. I don't know how it's been in your department over there, but you know, I have a, a son with whom I, I spar and share a lot of <laughs> spiritual discussions. And his point is, depending on how we define enlightenment, if we define it, Marishi's terms are um, total mastery over natural law. So his point is, well, that means no one's ever been enlightened. I say, well, how can you say that? And his point was that if either, either enlightenment, total mastery over natural law means that the person is a totally not nice person or they don't have total mastery over natural law. Because, yeah, he didn't quite use those polite words that I just used. But anyway, <laughs> but um, because he said, if anyone ever had total mastery over natural law, there would be no suffering on this earth. There would not have ever been. They would eliminate suffering totally, permanently for all times in the past and all no, times. would there be any evolution or growth. That would be the end of evolution. That would be the end of everything. Yeah. For instance... You know, and I'll get to this a little later. I'll describe uh, what I experience in more expanded states. But right now, um, if you're a master of the uh, laws of nature, as it were, um, Maharishi didn't mean that you can do absolutely everything. Do you honestly believe God or goddess can actually change the laws of nature? Wait a minute. The laws of nature are eternal, infinite. They've been set, they never were set in motion. They've always been there. Okay, you could say maybe God started them somehow, but he only started them in this creation, not the last creation. They're eternal. So even God, if there's fire, water, earth, air, ego, mind, and all that, they're eternal. Right. You don't get mastery over them, but you do get to experience them. That's what Maharishi meant, and I'll get into that later. And the other thing is that if your experience has expanded to universal proportions and the size of your consciousness now big enough, full enough, rich enough, quiet enough to see the whole show, see the cosmos for what it really is, you will be at the source of the laws of nature. You're not going to change the laws of nature. You're not going to change the elements of nature, fire, air, water, earth. They're, they're set. Those positions are taken. You know, you can't do much, but you can experience them as the self. You can see them. You can taste them. You can touch them. They can burn you. They can do whatever. And the other thing about um, mastery of the laws of nature, think about it. Let's say I could fly tomorrow, soar around the universe. Well, then everybody who sees me would have to have deserved that experience because it would be grand, ground shaking for them. The TM organization would have to change everything. There would be another master in the works. Right. Look at this guy. All of that would have to be accepted by the environment. It's not going to happen tomorrow. I don't expect to fly tomorrow. Now, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying it's not likely to happen because of the nature of the age and the nature of miracles, hmm. right? Yeah, I could say a couple things on that. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just kind of going back to what you were saying about this um, this river of enlightenment, quote unquote, just kind of running. I always look at it as a complete yet in process. Uh, presence you know it's always complete yet it's perpetually in process so it's it's not it's that there perfect. isn't um finality it's not that there isn't wholeness it's that there's the simultaneity of wholeness and perpetual process perpetual um fulfillment and perpetual discovery That's so in the uh 
and on the point about the laws of nature, it's it's something actually that uh, came up in a discussion a few weeks ago with somebody that I was working with. And the way that I see it, it's there would be no desire or there is no desire to change the the perfection of the laws of nature when one truly cognizes them as mm. one's own self. The 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 motivation to to move anything around to to make it different is not there because one sees the innate brilliance and the innate divinity and the innate coherence and the innate orderliness and organization and that perfection is shining as one's own reality it's also a condition which I consider to be surrendered. So it's this beautiful surrendered flow that's perpetually the self surrendering into itself, surrendering into its own divinity. Uh, at least that's the way that it's contextualized here. That's beautiful. I like the way you said that. And I'd only like to add to it, you know, one of my, um, One of my pet comments is individuality, okay? And the personal, mm. you know, it, I have never had an experience that's so silent, so quiet, so expanded that it wasn't connected to me. Mm. It doesn't matter what, however celestial it was, however much God was there or goddess was there. I never joined with that experience to the degree that it annihilated me mm. or got rid of me mm. and the individual me. Now, when many people, mm. it's another topic, many people who wake up, let's say, they get the first stage of awakening and or, or before they wake up, they say, I don't know who's having this experience. I have this, I'm bound in this, I have this. And it's nearly always there, but I don't know who's having that experience. Who's having that experience, Harry? They will ask me. I say, well, it's not a frog out there having the experience. So take a guess. <laughs> who's having it? Well, I guess I am, they would say, but, but I'm not, you know, I... I don't feel like that experience. Well, guess what? Pure consciousness, unboundedness, uh, experiences itself only. No other experience actually ultimately exists. So as a consequence, your first experience of it is unbounded. The eye of the experience, the knower is unbounded. You're not going to recognize that person day one because you never had that experience before and and you being told or your understanding is different from the experience so the eye of the experience will uh, eventually over time and practice acquire uh, the knowledge and the physiology and the senses and the and the environment and they'll get to be known as that ex part of that experience. And as a consequence, as your consciousness grows, it's not just the consciousness that um, expands, the physiology expands. How is that even possible? Well, it is. That's what I've experienced. Is that as my consciousness expanded, my blinking body also expanded. And how is that possible? Because my body became related to my immediate environment. And I saw the functioning of my body. I can look inside, I can look outside, I have a unified feeling with my immediate environment. But my senses are involved in that experience. It's not just my mind, my sense. My senses are connected to my body. My senses are connected to my emotion. They're connected to all of me, my body, mind, heart, everything. I love the environment. If I love the environment, there's my heart. That's a physical thing, right? <laughs> so it's as if I became the environment. My body became the environment. My uh, emotions became the environment. My senses became the environment. Over time, um, that expanded. 
Harry, can I ask a question? Or do no. you need to? Let me just finish this. Yes, yes, yes. Come to your point. But I have a, a do, I do have a question about well, it. Hold it. If you can remember it in a few minutes, it won't take long. So here I am having this experience of the body expanding, the mind expansion, the senses expanding. And these laws of nature we were talking about, you know, fire, air, water, earth. They are also personified. So when I have an experience of pure consciousness, when I go in there, there's pure consciousness. It's not separate from everything. It's throughout all the different layers. And, and when this pure consciousness is vibrating, that vibration is through all, all the layers of my consciousness. They're, they're, it's all whole. It has to be because what else is experiencing these layers other than the self, other than me in my unbounded value? I'll get to that in a minute. If I look closer at the um, uh, unbounded value of my consciousness, it's like millions of points, millions of waves. Hey, guess what? All these waves are connected. They're connected by the ocean. Who's the ocean? I'm the ocean. So this point and this point and this point and this point, all the shimmering stuff, all the shimmering structure of my own consciousness, Every point is connected to every other point. That's what Maharishi meant when he said, even the point is whole, because you can't have a point in a vibrating ocean that isn't the whole ocean. So the whole ocean is the whole ocean. The whole ocean is the point. The point is everything as well. Now, it's very orderly. When I look at pure consciousness, it's orderly. These waves aren't random one here, one there. They're all connected. There's a geometry, there's um, there's a mandala-like perfection to it, almost like a cosmic gem. And that vibration, that there's a sound to it. That intelligence is a sound. I can hear that sound. Must be the Veda or something, because it can't be anything else on that level. And these sounds, you know that every sound, every vibration has a form. Oh, here it is. There's a celestial level of my consciousness. The personifications of the laws of nature are not only in the absolute, they're in the vibration and the knowledge of the absolute, the vibration of the absolute. And these laws of nature, fire, air, water, earth, are personified. I see these heavens, they're not out there. I'm in that heaven, that heaven is in me. And the gods of the universe and the goddesses of the universe are the celestial level of everybody's existence. And why is that? Because, now this is, this is the most fascinating part for me. You know, you think you're going from pure consciousness to grosser and grosser level. No, it's the opposite of that. You're going from pure consciousness, it's almost empty wave function, to more and more celestial divine unbounded values, more and more, not less and less. Why is that? Because it takes a greater degree of purity, intelligence, expansion to experience the point values, the grosser values, so-called grosser values. And because that's what you are, you're the experience of that range of consciousness. And because it takes more, you Refine your physiology, your senses, your perceptions, everything to the degree that even this so-called material values have become absolute values, have become celestial values. Now, the laws of nature, fire, air, water, earth, if you look outside this room, everything's made out of them. You got the earth, you're walking on it, you got light, you got water, you got everything made out of it. And these laws of nature. So suddenly, you're, you're not just in your, you're not just sitting in this room anymore. You're sitting in your environment. You are those laws of nature because those David's took you there. Those gods of creation took you there. Those goddesses of creation took you there. Okay, if you want to call them impulses of creative intelligence, I'm okay with that too. I like to call them gods and goddesses because I've seen them all the time. They're just there. But they're part of a whole. They're not independent of the knowledge level of my consciousness and the absolute level of my consciousness or the manifest level of my consciousness. Now, the gross relative, so-called gross relative, is the most fascinating thing for me of all. 
because the relative, changing relative, is not the relative at all. It's the furthest, fullest expression of individuality that can possibly exist. It's absolute. It's eternal and infinite. And that infinite and eternal value of the relative, you begin to see in post-unified states of consciousness. And that's where the bliss exists. That's where the joy exists. That's where the healing exists. When a person's consciousness, I, you know, these aren't states of consciousness. These are states of reality. Everybody has them. I'm not talking about something that I have. I'm talking about something that I know everybody has, right? Okay, you're going to ask your question. Oh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> what oh, are you going to say? So beautiful, so beautiful, so beautiful. Yes. Um, there was something else that you said after that, though, that I just thought was so beautiful. Oh, and, okay. and related so perfectly to energy healing. So I just have to bring that out before I forget it. Okay. And that is that you were saying that it's the process of further expansion and refinement of consciousness that actually allows the individual to go deeper into the relative level of their existence. And this is so beautiful to me because it's absolutely right at the forefront of the experiences that I'm having with energy healing, which is that the access to the resources required to do the big healing. Like if a person's been on a journey of illness and it's been a long time and it's built up in layers and it's kind of a chronic condition and it seems to be immovable in their bodies, the level of intelligence required to move that is a very cosmic level of That's intelligence. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and that ultimately the answer to healing that type of illness is the evolution of consciousness to that cosmic level where those cosmic devas or those cosmic laws of nature are accessible and then drawing upon that level of personal power and resource wisdom to it shifts it's like it shifts out there some slight shift at that very expanded level of self causes the shift in the inside the body and it all it happens at once but it's it, it's like the um the switchboard or the, the control center. The control center is at a very expanded level of consciousness. Uh, so I, I thank you for that, that statement because that was just so spot on. And I just had to make that little energy healing connection. Andrew, did you have something? Uh, sure, yeah, I could say a few things. Um, first, I just want to thank Harry for such a beautiful description. Oh yeah, oh yeah, um, great. And I t totally uh, resonate with that sort of fractal line uh, individualization uh, within the self and yeah. how every point is containing and permeative of every other point and that the ocean is reflecting within itself ad infinitum as that uh, that shimmering glistening uh, reality of radiance and uh, I just wanted to also make a point perhaps for the viewers because you know, what Harry is describing is a relatively well unified, integrated uh, condition. And some, not everyone uh, necessarily tastes that. Uh, and we, and we, went, we know uh, just through observing the spiritual marketplace that there are certainly uh, cases that are a little bit flatter and drier and uh, not as uh, sophisticatedly articulated for sure. But uh, that it's, you, you know, Harry's describing the, the potential and the possibility and, and what he is saying is the actual uh, that just hasn't uh, re revealed itself yet and isn't clear. Yes. And there's, uh, you know, there's different uh, stages, if you will, or different depths of recognition. And sometimes there can be a great deal of that refined recognition of uh, that the totality contained as the sort of condensated representation of itself. And, and then there can be a, a stage of uh, what is classically referred to as nothingness that kind of where that seems to fall away. And uh, 
and there can be a sense of loss perhaps and and uh and uh and a sense that something is missing or something has gone wrong or, or whatever the case may be and and that's just a temporary uh a temporary stage you know because that uh it just is a, a re-revealing in a new way and uh, uh the the uh the depth of our reality as this this one that is experiencing itself is just uh uh, tasting itself in in these different values so that's that's all i wanted to thank you for bringing me to birth <laughs> <laughs> harry my question was you were talking about how the body the experience is is kind of one of the expansion of the body and i was thinking it would be really interesting for our listeners if you elaborated on that a little bit, that experience a little bit, that was kind of my question at that point was that I think a lot of people think of their bodies or themselves as limited by the actual physical form, the actual physical human form. Yes. And don't quite understand how they could conceive their body to be so vast that it embraces the entire cosmos. Okay. And yet it's important, I think it's a very important point that for people to be able to understand that we are the actual body, what we know ourselves as is bigger than just this human fleshy corporeal form. I think what, uh, <clears throat> what Andrew brought forth is very valid. And, well, I'll get into what you said in a moment. Yeah, yeah no, do it. But, um, and I agree with it a hundred percent. And you know, <laughs> the the thing is, you know, when I look back at my life and look at the little glimmers I had years and years ago, and this and that that seemed like nothing, they weren't ultimately nothing. They were a taste of what I'm talking about. And one of the problems is, is our minds, our intellects say that's really nothing and that's really nothing or that's small and that's separate from me or because I'm full of anxiety, I can't be having big experiences or because I have, I have whatever disease or this or that. I don't personally think there's any obstructions in human life that will keep, permanently keep uh, self-awareness away and the reason is that self-awareness pure consciousness is also that limitation that you call mm -hmm. is also that now <laughs> i'm not saying it doesn't exist okay but remember what i said your consciousness it vibrates it's everywhere every point is that pure consciousness so this point isn't you know this point's divine. You can't say that point isn't. Right. Or that point isn't. Now, you could call that a theory if you like, but my experience is that you can ask my wife if I'm a perfect human being <laughs> and she'll tell you the truth. I'm going to have a section in the back of one of my books that says, Ask Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> there is no perfect human beings on that level. The perfection is in the whole show and and the perfection is in having a state of consciousness that even if you have anxiety depression this that cancer whatever that they don't overshadow the wholeness of the self that's the goal getting rid of those things that's your department dorothy i'm not good enough for that i i, <laughs> I no no honestly it i i don't know what to do there but I'll tell you what happens, what has happened to me, you know. I was in hiding most of my life. I never talked about my experience up until maybe 10 years ago. And even then it was just a little bit because it was my experience. What the heck, you know, I, I realized most people weren't having that. And I had lots of instances, of, that's your experience, Mary. I, I don't know what you're talking about. So I gave up on that. But then about five years ago, six years ago or something, did I tell you the story? If I did, no, I haven't I told you. So. I don't recall. Well, in any case, I had this couple over, you know. I had known them for lots of years, and we discussed experiences from time to time. And 
we were sitting in our dining room and we all got up, walking to the living room. And I looked at this lady and I, and I don't know where this came from. I had no idea. I looked at her and I said, you don't know who I am, do you? Just like that. And she froze in place. Her eyes got really big. She didn't say anything for 10, 15 minutes, nothing. She was in a kind of bliss shock, as they described it later. And then she started telling me what she went into. This lady, I'd known her for years. She had no end. There was no reason to suspect a transformation was going to take place like that. This lady went into a, a state of consciousness. It's, it's there to this day. Um, hard to define, but it was there. Pure consciousness was there, unboundedness. And she said, Harry, I've arrived home. I've arrived. What, what did you do? I said, I don't know. And you know, I'm more shocked than you are. <laughs> and supposed to wake up just because we're gabbing. <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't get facetious, but you know what I mean. I wasn't using a Mahavakya or anything. I was just, we were just talking. And this lady woke up. Boom. She went into a, the beginnings of unitive consciousness, which has evolved over the last five, six years into something grand that never stopped. Beautiful. And then I say to myself, I say to myself, self. What just happened? Just from understanding this quiet lady who hardly ever talked, just from understanding her experience in five words, she flipped, positively flipped into a state of unified consciousness, expanded consciousness and state. Well, maybe there's something to these meetings. Maybe we ought to do more of them. Her husband was a fellow. Now, him I've talked to many times. He's very gabby, talkative. Very, um, lots of flashy experience. Mother divine, this Christian kind of stuff, and, and gods, and very, very flashy, and very, very attached to those, attached to these mother figures so much that his wife was starting to feel jealous. <laughs> and, but um, and I kept telling him, you know, th these these experiences you're having, they're great. It's wonderful. It shows you have stuff, but there's no there's no connection between today's experience and tomorrow's experience. Now you have this, and now you have that. What's connecting it all? And I go I talk to him twenty times. A couple of years later, it took a couple of years. We were, you know, we're almost going like that. And Kathy and I look at each other after some of these sessions, and I'd say, "That guy's never coming back." I just <laughs> lost him as a friend, you know, because he was he was fighting for his soul. And a couple of years later, something started happening. It didn't happen in one shot, but it happened in five or six shots. Ever since his wife went into the state. There's no way he could accept that, that she went somewhere that he didn't go. So he was fighting like a dog to have the same experience. I said, you're not going to have the same. You're going to have your own experience. And then he flipped over to me. And now, five, six years later, 20, 30 people have done that. I don't do anything. I'm not like you. I don't have that kind of focus. I just I, opened I my mouth. Understand. <laughs> Harry, I really don't experience that I do anything either. Okay. Um, it's more like just creating a condition or a context yes. for people to do their own work, essentially. Oh, of course. And that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. It's much better, but yes, that's what I mean. And I'm no special person. I've had experiences uh, all my life, and I learned that when people begin to understand their experiences, in relation to somebody who's discussing it in a holistic way, they within themselves, within not anything 
that you're really doing, but within themselves, if they realize, usually what these people realize is, uh, is that I've always had this. They flip and then they say, give me my money back. <laughs> well, no, not, that, not that I'm charging anything, I'm not, but, but uh, um, in the early days of waking up, it's so natural, so simple, so this, so that, you know, you're not going to write home about it. And, you know, when I first started talking about higher states of consciousness, I thought people would laugh at me. You know, they'd say, well, you know, uh, what are you talking about, Harry? You just, you know, you, you know, it's like, look, I have an arm here, you see? And there's another arm here. It's that natural. It's that simple. However, it, I'm not saying it isn't a dramatic change. It is. Life is now in terms of that uh, reality. Now, you asked about this physical expansion, and it's kind of interesting. If you look at it, what I started to describe, let, let's skip pure consciousness. Let's skip knowledge level of consciousness. Let's skip uh, the deva level of consciousness and go right into the relative. Now, all those so-called... Uh, Sheets or layers of consciousness are connected to the relative. And in, in states of consciousness, post unified state, you begin to physically see that. In early days of unity or unified consciousness, I, it was very abstract for me two years ago. And, you know, is this what Maharishi meant? Is this what the gurus meant? Is this boom, boom, lots of questions? But eventually you get it and uh, you say, well, uh, big deal. It's not a big deal. What there is, is a permanent connectedness that's on a new level. The new level is a unified level. The outside and the inside seem to be very friendly with each other, very porous, no, no obstructions, no separation. And, uh, and that applies to the absolute level, the deva level, the knowledge level, and the relative level. Once this unified sense gets clear, it becomes physical. You begin to see it. The functions of the body, you begin to see them somehow. Can you, can you, you know, can you actually see the liver and this? No, but you know what's going on. It's, there's layers in the body, and those layers are the same as that are in the immediate environment. And then, um, some many many years ago, I started experiencing. You know, I was looking at these points in, 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 um, on the absolute level, all this vibrating light, shimmering light of consciousness. You know, what are those points? And this, and this answer came to me, or this intuition came to me. This is the stars. I said, what? They're the stars? Those glimmers? And, and then then suddenly what happened to me is, is it's like, how can I say it? Like a trillion linear beams of light connected to every star in the universe. But that was my linear, that was my geom geometry, that was my organization of consciousness. And the whole thing was a big block of physical reality. And here's the stars whirling around up there, but they're whirling around there, whirling around my head. All these different layers of my physiology were the layers of the stars, the galaxy. And guess what? As soon as I started seeing the stars, then I saw the universe. The universe was in me. I was in the universe. And that's when I recognized that I am both a physical body and a cosmic body. I was the universe, but I was the body of the universe, not just the mind, heart, but the body of the universe. My consciousness had acquired cosmic senses, cosmic hearing, cosmic smell. That's how I knew the laws of nature. That's how I knew I was those laws of nature. That's what being master of the laws of nature. It's kind of a letdown in a sense because, you know, you're not doing anything. It sounds grand and wonderful, and it is. It's very blissful. But you know what the most blissful part about higher states of consciousness is? Andrew, you covered it. It's the connectedness of 
everything. It doesn't matter if it's little points in your immediate environment or it's all the layers of consciousness all the way to the beginning. It's the connectedness. And guess what? That connectedness is eternal. It's infinite. And because you know you are that infinite, eternal, absolute, you as a person, as an individual, as a, as a human being, that's the most satisfying thing to know is that you're never going to end. Of course, you never started, either, but you're never going to end. <laughs> okay. It's your turn. Uh, Andrew, if, uh, I have something that I'm curious, but if you would like to go ahead. Sure, yeah. Uh, again, very beautiful. Harry, thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot there. I think one thing I'd I'm kind of having fun with uh, chatting with you is kind of going back and forth, bouncing back and forth on little things. And you mentioned kind of how, how this, this point can't be divine and this one not. And that's so, uh, so true. You know, there's only, only uh, divinity and expressing as uh, the essence and the appearance of, of itself within its own uh, self-conscious awareness. And one thing that I've found in, in working with people is that sometimes there can be just subtle kind of misinterpretations when it comes to, to languaging and, and things like that. So I just wanted to clarify that not all points are necessarily aligned with divine truth or divine realization. And, and so, yes, they are divine in their essence and, and, and even in their appearance when we see that. Um, but there are you know, certain things that are not necessarily uh, you might say, uh, r flowing with the stream of, of divine intelligence in, in, a, in, a, um, in a way which is uh, supportive and, and, and coherently uh, communing with the, with the totality of those uh, reflective individualizations of this one uh, infinity. And uh, just one other point. Oh, yes. Uh, and, and you've kind of come to this so many times in different ways, Harry, as you've been speaking, is that really what makes the difference, it, it's, it's, I love the way that you kind of, uh, both the way that you emphasize understanding, because that's something that uh, really resonates here. And I also emphasize so much that, that it's, it's not something that we can't understand or that we have to be blind to or walk around feeling like we, we don't know what's going on, that the intellect can serve the self knowing itself and seeing itself and tasting itself and exploring itself and describing itself. And, and that's, that's, that's where that richness of, uh, of that reflective individualization in human life really comes into play. But there is this difference between something being the case and it being recognized as being the case. Mm -hmm. So, it's like having, you know, the classic example is having a bank account with $2 million in it and uh, not knowing that you have the bank account. And <laughs> it's, uh, you're, you're on the street, you're begging for, uh, for food, you feel that you're, that you're broke. This whole time you have this, this wealth, you have this, uh, this richness. And, but what makes the difference is really seeing that, is recognizing that. And um, there's something to be said about the enlivening of the intelligence of this totality through its self-recognition in the appearance of human life. It's, it's finding this sweet flowering in that, yeah? And there's a uniqueness there. There's a uniqueness, you know? So there, although there's qualitative consistency and similarity, there's also this beautiful... Uh, uniqueness. So that's all I, I wanted to. Beautiful. You brought me down to earth again. <laughs> I have those around me that keep bringing me down. So I try to sh uh, share the share the love. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, just, just one or two comments. One is we're born on earth because there are obstacles here. Hmm. That's why we're here. Fully understand that. And those obstacles, what do they do? They make us grow. Mm. Now, how do they do that? 
well, first of all, they make us jump over the hurdles that we have to jump over because that's what we do. Anybody who lives on earth has a family, has friends, has a job, has whatever, is going to go through challenges, lots of challenges. And probably not least of which is if you grow old, those are all hurdles. And what do these hurdles do? They kind of, um, they stretch consciousness really wide, right? Like, like you got a bad thing here and you got a good thing here. They're so far apart. Consciousness over time, getting burned over and over and over again in small ways, anger here, anxiety there, cancer there, this, that, friends leave you this, whatever, whatever, over and over again, you realize that there's something more stable than that within you. And it gets an opportunity to come out because there's these sparks here, spark, here, spark. Ah, ah, what, what is this all about? It's about stability, wholeness, love, and unity. Not that I'm denying anything you say. I'm not. I'm giving them the full value. They're about the growth of unity consciousness, unified consciousness. They're necessary. They're necessary for that. And sometimes I feel a bit like a pile driver or something. <laughs> I'm not, you know, people say I jump around and I do. I have consciousness go there, consciousness go there. And any effect I have on earth is with other people has come from that kind of, um, I don't view it as knowledge at all. I view it as, oh, never mind, I won't even go there. <laughs> but I agree with you. But without without the hurdles on earth, we don't have evolution. And of course, yeah, I'm, I'm totally. I buy that, 100%. Despite yeah. the fact that I'm talking about the stars and all right. <laughs> yeah, it's in the contrast, right? The contract. It's in the contract. You signed it. <laughs> and uh, it, in that sense, we can see as everything serving, you know, <laughs> when we have the eyes to see it and when we have that, that vision which holds even the obstacles and those things which seem to be distractions or, or limitations as a part of that, that total refinement and that total... Um, fulfillment of, of what we are so um, uh, just to make the connection the cosmic connection between those boundaries and limitations and the cosmic body it's come to my awareness just recently i think it was a couple months ago i did a webinar on um, the etheric body and there was this analysis of the process of fulfillment rising from the source of creation in mounting waves of desire until it manifests as an expression on the surface. And Marishi's point was that when you pick up that wave right at the source, you pick it up just as it's emerging from the source of creation, instead of experiencing the desire as a kind of longing emptiness that's driving you to whatever, whatever, you pick it up as an expression of complete fulfillment, because that's what comes from the absolute. Only expressions of total fulfillment are coming out of the absolute. And that as that wave of fulfillment rises to the surface to eventually be expressed as a material form. It's experienced as, as that wave of fulfillment gathering and garnering all the resources it needs to become expressed. So rather than experience of like, oh, I wish I had this thing and this thing. It's more like, I'm just, it's like a, sort of like a very refined intention right it comes out as an in, as a fulfillment and then the intention is there and i'm and i'm moving toward that goal and i'm moving toward that goal and 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 oh nature's now bringing me this that i need for that and it's bringing me this piece and all the pieces are coming together and then boom on the surface it comes together okay so the thing is that and this is partly a question and partly an observation is that there's a natural gap between the unmanifest level of creation and that finest relative level of creation. There's a natural gap there in, from being totality resting in its own nature to totality 
taking form, even though it's a subtle form, then it occurs to me, there's another natural gap. There has to be between an idea or an intention or a thought and like the actual manifestation of that thought. Like there's, there you can have the thought, oh, maybe I'll get a tattoo. But when you actually go get the tattoo, there's no turning back, right? <laughs> I mean, not to use that as an example, but you understand what I'm saying is that that's another gap right there. So I was looking, this is recent, looking deep, deep into the mechanics of that gap. Because what I realized is there are specific laws of nature whose job is essentially to say no to about 99.9% .9 of every idea, intention, dream, concept, uh, assumption, you know, with, like this whole, our reality is full of all kinds of things that could happen, but only a small bit tend to break forth to the, right? Like, you made a book, you know, like a book. It's like a real life, actual book right there. It was an <laughs> idea at one point, but it's not a book right now. It's in my house, not just yours, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's certain laws of nature that sit right there at that level because there's a lot of ideas that, that bubble up. Infinite, it's infinite profusion of creativity and intelligence is coming out of the absolute. But so I was going into these laws of nature that are right there at the gap between something that's an idea and like it actually being an actual real physical five uh, primal elements, earth, water, air, space, fire thing. And what I noticed is that the controlling aspects of that level of manifestation in our small individual world here on earth, those controlling aspects are cosmic devata. They are cosmic devas. They actually exist out in the larger field of creation, but they influence what manifests in this level of creation. So I realized if suppose we wanted to manifest something that was low probability, like I could say, oh, I'm going to manifest the sun comes up tomorrow and that should be a piece of cake, right? But what if you wanted to manifest something that was a little lower? Like my friend is in fourth stage cancer and their doctors have given two weeks to live. And how do we manifest a complete remission? If they've been on that path several years and it's kind of been a slow decline, right? How do we, how do we manifest a complete remission? That, that requires something more. It requires a level of autonomy and connectedness to a level of nature's functioning that allows, um, that allows the individual to make a small, small, almost imperceptible move on the level of their consciousness that creates a dramatic, real, powerful change at this level of reality. So I was looking into it and what I saw was that I was trying to identify what level of creation is that level of, where are those laws of nature? And they looked galactic to me. I could identify them in multiple galaxies. And again, Harry, this is kind of, uh, you know, leveraging off of the experience you were talking about, because I'm also having that experience that my body's the cosmos. And there are all these layers of cosmic reality. And there's certain layers that I access, for instance, just at, within our galaxy, there are many archives of knowledge. And when I'm in that level, when I'm exploring that level of my consciousness, I can find um, archives for all things that are built all of Stapativate, all of this, or, or uh, blueprints of human physiologies, or, you know, they're all at different layers of cosmic reality. We find different aspects of intelligence and, and natural law, but this, this big layer, this big level, this multi-galactic level that's in charge of what becomes and what doesn't. And there's a lot of no, there's a lot more no in that than there is yes. And so that was, that was one of the interesting, and these are just, I'm just kind of like free flowing here a little bit with you guys, because this is stuff that I've been sort of looking at and playing with over the last few weeks, you know, since, since the last time we talked, Andrew. Um, but, it's, but it fascinates me because, you know, it's directly applicable to our lives right now in this world, you know, things happening 
both at individual and collective levels of humanity, you know, how can we as individuals, if we're having, you know, we have access to higher levels of knowledge and power and wisdom, energy, flow, creativity, then how we're using that to support really positive life supporting, really positive life supporting change in our world right now. And if you have any kind of See, I'm just shining my individual flashlight on this level of reality. And I'm saying, this is kind of what it looks like to me, but I would just love to hear what your, uh, you know, what your filter, how it looks through your filter, because I could use, I feel like I could use just a little more detail um, in order to access a little more completely some of the, the juicy bits that are in that, <laughs> that are in that more juicy than we've got. <laughs> well, that's, I, you get wet. <laughs> I got the water right oh, here. Yeah, yeah, so. I got the water right here. <laughs> the thing, there's two things here that are very interesting to me. One is, and we've had this discussion before. Um, you and I are healing other people. They're healing themselves always. Always, 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 you're healing yourself. To the degree you're able to heal yourself, know yourself at the moment of the healing, that's what healing yourself is. At that point, um, that's, that's the point value, this gap value that you're talking about. At that point, you're able to heal somebody else. But you're only able to heal that other person that other person is not an individual only. That individual has a family that deserves and doesn't deserve him or her and has children, has this, has that. It's complicated. You can't figure it all out. All you can do is the best you can. Now, there's a state of consciousness that I wasn't even going to go here, but you guys are quite demanding. <laughs> <laughs> There's a state of consciousness after the unified state. Obviously, calls it Brahman consciousness, but you know, be that as it may, that state of consciousness is all in the absolute. The gap's gone. It's over. The gap doesn't exist there anymore. It's all in the. Marishi called it Leisha Vidya, right? Um, I don't quite buy Leisha Vidya because. Because in the absolute, everything is absolute. Everything is absolute. Every object is absolute. It doesn't feel like the Leisha Vidya to me. It feels more real than it ever did before. Every single point, the relative, the concreteness, the universe, the stars, the gods, they feel more concrete now. Now when everything's in the absolute. Remember Maurice used to talk about activity in the absolute? And activity in the absolute is only activity in the absolute if that's what you're experiencing, if that's what you recognize. Just like Andrew was saying about recognition, right? So you know you got the money in the bank, you can now spend it if somebody gives you the key or you happen to have the key. In unity consciousness, you have the vault with the money, but you can't spend it yet. Afterwards, you get the key and you can take some of the money out. But the thing about Brahman consciousness there's a, there's a saying in the Upanishad, something like that. It's the field from which knowledge or thoughts do not return. Mm. Nothing returns from it. It's, it's all there. Everything mm -hmm. there in front of you. And to the degree that human consciousness can experience Brahman, everything's in there. God's in there. Davis and the laws of nature on that. That doesn't mean you can't do anything. It means you are now the uh, focal point of infinity and the point and all points where your consciousness go. So when you're when you're doing healing from the level of say unified consciousness, then then you're not healing one one cancer patient or one whatever, you're healing the whole world. And the reason you're healing the whole world is because that, that concreteness of the experience, that connectedness of the experience, is more dominant than the point. 
why is it more dominant? It's because that's who you are. You're you're the dominant dominant value of the point and the wholeness. You as a person. Now, it doesn't make much sense to talk about BC. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of intellectual sense at all. But because it doesn't make sense. It's not intellectual. Imagine, you know, one way to look at it is, you know, people start meditating and they get their understanding and they think the ocean has a surface and, you know, they're going to dive, get deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, when I started meditating, that was the wrong, that was the wrong information for me. I I was, I was not on the surface. I didn't have anywhere to go. This idea that you're going to go subtler and subtler um, is, you, what if you're the whole ocean already? And, and somebody tells you, well, dive to the bottom now. Well, uh, where am I diving to? Which direction is it? Can you point to it? I'm at the bottom, I'm in the middle, and I'm on the surface. So I had, so I, you know, I followed the instructions as I could, and um, don't want to get too much into that. But do you know what I mean? You're the whole ocean. Now, this, I've always been very. Uh, I've never thought of the world much. I've thought of the universe, okay? I've thought of the days, I've thought of the stars, and I've thought of my immediate environment, but I've never thought of the world very much. A few years ago, I started thinking of the world. And the reason I started thinking of the world is as these people around me started waking up, it connected me to the society. And, and I kind of started thinking about United States and, and all the other countries of the world and, and the whole world. And then I started having experiences of my physiology uh, being a conduit for healing the world. And it was my body more than anything else. I have to say that it wasn't that the heart wasn't there and it wasn't the mind wasn't there, but it was kind of like I could experience my body as a circuit board for the, uh, the qualities and influence of the stars and the impulses of creative intelligence or the devata and the gods and goddesses of creation. I could, I could literally see these streams of light and energy uh, sort of sort of like a puppet you know, on a billion strings coming into me. You know, every star in it. Can't imagine how many there are. You couldn't count them. It's just coming into my body, coming everywhere. And they're entering my entire body, you know, and, and that star and that galaxy going like this, and my arm is moved it, and whatever, whatever. And but but and then going out from there to the world, kind of a little bit far more flat, much smaller, this huge unbounded uh, flow of energy, flow of love, flow of uh, light and, and vibrations and colors coming into my body. And every point, just take one point, goes here, and then it goes out there. And because I have a body, and that body is me, specific, Harry, and same for you or anybody else but me, that body God and God has made this body or the universe created me from the laws of nature, if you want to put it that way. Because I'm a physical body, those physical attributes coming in from those cosmic sources were able to go to that person and that person and that society and that group and that. And, and because there was a physiology that was specific, it was like, uh, what? Like, you know, hydroelectric power comes from a river, you know, and, and they 
and you know the river flows through these generators and then they go store it in some relay station and then you send it out to all these houses, all these people. But you, they only get that, that electricity if they pay for it. So I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just making a point that there's a process. That's what I feel like. Felt like and feel like is that if we awake human being, that wakefulness is the uh, conduit for universal healing to flow to the different societies, the different worlds, all the different individuals in the world. But it takes a body on earth. God can't do it without us. Right. Right. Totally get that. Can't. Totally no, they, that. Can. they need us just as much as we need them. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, that's, well, not, that's an upset, that's, right? Pardon? That's an upset about that. But it's all spontaneous. I'm not doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, one of my perceptions about that is because the human physiology produces soma. Yeah. And soma feeds the gods. So without the physical form, we are not, if, you know, if a person do, isn't, if they die and they're not in their physical body, they're not producing that specific level of expression of totality which actually folds back in and activates particular values of cosmic unified intention consciousness wholeness in the way that soma does in the way that soma does well, in those not. listeners who are not familiar with that word soma you can look that up on my knowledge base <laughs> There's a little description there, but it's the finest byproduct of digestion, essentially. So the photons go into the plants and the plants are at the beginning of the food chain, right? So whatever you eat after the plant, you eat the plant or you eat something that ate the plant, doesn't matter. But at some point, your body breaks that food down into its original little tiny, tiny, tiny particles, which are subatomic particles these photons and the photons are ancient and they contain the entire story of the whole universe within them. And that byproduct of breaking that down gives rise to that material, which is so fine that it doesn't, it's not used as much by the actual physicality of our body as it is by the consciousness itself. It goes in and it feeds that deepest level of consciousness. No, Just in case you didn't know what someone was. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm done. You know, I was thinking, I've always been fascinated by healers, you know, particularly really good healers, because Thank you. the process is exactly the same for the healer as it is. It's kind of like a technique for gaining more and more self-awareness because you're always successful to the degree that you're you're in the self and not losing the self when you're focused on focusing on something as specific as a disease that's Darn right Darn that's, right harry that's absolutely correct and and that's one of the hurdles um that help healers wake up mm -hmm. once their consciousness is big enough, full enough, rich enough that they can accept even that terrible thing that's going on in somebody else's body as not happening in somebody else's body. You can unite with it enough that the wholeness of your own experience can enter that point value. That's the densest point value you, uh, you'll find on Earth in, in these kind of diseases that people are still. Right. Kali Yuga. Yeah. And so I consider that an extremely valuable technique for gaining enlightenment, but you have to be a good healer to benefit from that. Otherwise, you take it on yourself. Right. Precisely. Precisely. It's only through the establishment in being. And then that's when one knows that the other person is actually. The person who's ill is actually the one who's healing themselves through that level that we share, actually, we share that cosmic level of experience. 
And all the healer is doing is holding that space of silence for the individual to access and engage that level of their own intelligence so that they can make the transformation they need to make. It doesn't hurt to love them because some love is kind of like a catalyst or an activator for a transformation. Knowledge is beautiful, but it's eternal and it doesn't change. But love kind of gives a little, gives a little turn in there, gets it going. <laughs> it gets it all going. <laughs> you know, in, in BC, in states post unity, it's, everything can change, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, everything, everything. Mari, she said something like, uh, you know, the great thing about Brahman consciousness, you're never wrong. Beautiful. I love that's, that. That's kind of interesting. No, I love it because basically what it's saying is that there's only one story in town and that's divinity self-interacting. So literally, regardless of what happens, that's the divine creating layers upon layers of self-interaction. And if something happens that's say, not life supporting, uh, you know, crime is committed or something like that, everybody who's involved in that, that scenario will at some point or another will atone for what's going on. There will be a balancing. There will be a coming back to wholeness from that experience. And it's just inevitable. And it's really the divine finding more and more creative ways to express itself and to integrate itself with this creation that it is. Well, everything, I don't really think of them as retribution for the wrongs that you've done. I think of them just as another way to grow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I do too. It's like layers of action. It's layers yeah, of action. Layers of action. There's, there's not really any judgment right? If some action goes in a certain direction, we could say life supporting or non-life supporting, but whichever, whatever direction the action goes, is just going in that direction because at some point the cycle returns and it, it completes the totality, expresses itself as a resolution. So do we want to take one more stab at, uh, at, understanding self-awareness and how important that is and how simple it is and we'll come down out of the cosmic healing and the Brahman consciousness and we'll go into something that might directly benefit <laughs> immediately somebody. It's a lovely idea, Harry. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a beautiful idea. Speaking of resolutions, we can bring it all back into its completion. <laughs> Will it certainly be my delightful experience and my surprising experience how, um, how every single human being on earth has self-awareness. Doesn't matter how little, but you have enough to be alive and that's self-awareness. And why that person, whoever it might be, isn't conscious of that is still way beyond me. I can't figure it out. But I do know that the only thing that a person who's awake and a person who isn't, there's only one difference between the two. One is conscious of that wakefulness. The other one has it, but they're not conscious of it. They don't get it. Why don't they get it? They misunderstand. They forgot. They forgot their divine source. And in that forgetting, they're wound up in the up and downs of life. The, the awake person is also wound up in the up and downs of life, but there is a stability as if underneath all that or in all that that tells the awake person that um, that even though everything matters and every, all this change is important and you love this person and you don't love that person quite as much or whatever, yet all that up and down in your life is, is what? Stabilized by or understanding is deep enough and the experience is there. It's, this is unbounded ocean 
of shimmering consciousness or just intuitive consciousness that's there that's connected to you just enough for you to know that you're an eternal and infinite being and that you're not going to get overpowered by this impulse or that impulse or that disease or that this and that you will go on and on and on forever and it's not just because your body's aging does not mean you are aging you are changing you are the infinite source of all the change and that is your atma that is your unbounded self it's unbounded because it was there before this body and it will be there after this body it was before this world and it will be there after this world beautiful beautiful right? oh it's beautiful harry it's mm -hmm. beautiful andrew did you want to comment on that or say anything finish up well i guess i'll just second what harry said. <laughs> I love what you, you say, Andrew. You pull things together, which is really nice. But I did you get you a little cosmic there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, uh, oh, go ahead. So. Okay. This pure, silent, self-conscious awareness is always the supreme immediacy that sees itself interact with itself, senses and knows its own intelligence. And there's zero distance in this. When it comes to the to the healing, you know, sometimes I I feel that healing isn't necessarily about a, a remission or mm -hmm something seeming to change on the level of uh, you know perceived formation mm. but our ability to become one with that mm. to fully accept that and to allow it to seamlessly run its course without resistance mm. So I'm, I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to, to speak with you both. So thank you. Oh, Andrew, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. I'm reminded of a friend who um, had a near-death experience and uh, a lovely man. And uh, he realized at the moment that his coat got caught in the train door and the train took off from the station. His coat was and he fell down in there, it was a mess, but, but he survived. And the, the reason he survived was he remembered that little children relax. Mm. When like, like if there's a car accident or something, they just kind of relax and they surrender to the flow of the movement that's around them. And so he just did that. And he knew that if he hadn't done that, he would not have survived that incident. But it was a kind of surrendering that took place within him that allowed him to go through that and to come out of it. Essentially, you know, I mean, he lived. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good when the train is taken out of the station, right? <laughs> it's coming out of the station. <laughs> but, but I really do appreciate it, Andrew, because, you know, in the, in the end, people heal themselves and their story, the, the story, the blueprint, their life blueprint is going to go the way it's going to go. And it's really not up to the healer to try to manipulate or change that, mm -hmm. but it's just to provide that level of perception that allows them to connect the experience back to wholeness. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, they gain the evolutionary value from the experience they're having. And when they gain that evolutionary value, then they essentially satisfy it they complete what they needed to complete from that illness and you know when they've learned the lesson that the illness was teaching them you could say which is essentially that wholeness is present even in that point of expression and that once that's done then they've they've satisfied nature they've satisfied the laws whatever laws of nature were causing some symptoms in the body those laws of nature then are satisfied and some fresh new laws of nature can come in or if it's not their 
story. If their story doesn't involve surviving the experience, then they don't survive. But that also is a sacred act. That's also precious and sacred. Mm. Oh, so beautiful. I, I really appreciate so much, both of you. And I really, I want to say thank you to the audience too for being with us tonight and, uh, you know, joining us for this deep, deep dive into the really delicate, really subtle mechanics of the awakening or blossoming of consciousness and that it's, Harry, it, your presentation and Andrew too, so simple. You know, I feel as if you're allow, you're bringing the information out in a way that really is accessible to everyone and activates each person's ability to recognize it in themselves. And that's just so beautiful and it's so powerful. Thank you. Thank you both. That was great. I love yeah. being here. You guys are terrific. I really like your last comments, Andrew, about there being no distance and, and the immediacy of, of consciousness. And that's certainly how I experience things. The growth of consciousness has to do with eliminating distance from first nearby, then farther and farther until there's no distance. Mm -hmm. That's the same as saying you start joining with or assimilating all of existence. Mm -hmm. So I thought those were beautiful words. Andrew's helping to create a standard for our entire field, I feel. Andrew, I use your terminology all the time. It's just beautiful. It's because it's so spot on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again next month. Bye. <laughs> Bye.